everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, hello to everyone in the room and to everyone at home today watching. Our chair today is uh, Jason Okundai. Jason is a writer of essays, features and profiles on politics and culture for publications such as The Guardian, The London Review of Books, British Vogue, GQ, Vice, Dazed and ID. He also co-curates the digital archive Black and Gay Back in the Day, which documents black LGBT life in Britain since the 1970s. He holds a first class degree in human, social and political science from Pembroke College, University of Cambridge. And his first book, Revolutionary Acts, A Social History of Black Gay Men in Britain, uh, will be published by Faber in spring 2024. Um, Paddy Doherty. Uh, Paddy is a historian of empire with a particular interest in the British Empire anti-colonial resistance and the cultural impact of imperialism. He went to Oxford University and is the author of The Khyber Pass, A History of Empire and Invasion, which came out in 2007. His second book is Blood and Bronze, The British Empire and the Sack of Benin. Published by Hearst Publishers in December 2021, this book reveals the true story and the shocking British wrongdoing behind the plunder of the famous Benin bronzes. Um, and finally is Luke Pepperer. Luke is a writer, broadcaster, historian, and anthropologist with an expertise on the deep past and traditional cultures of Africa. He was born in Ghana and read archaeology and anthropology at Oxford, where he studied ancient and medieval African history. Recently, he's written and presented Africa Written Out of History, which is a documentary for Dan Snow's History Hit. Um, he's appeared on a panellist on Real Fake History and on numerous podcasts. His debut non-fiction history book, Motherland, 500,000 Years of African History, Cultures and Identity, comes out late in 2023. Um, thank you so much. Um, over to Jason. Great. Uh, thank you so much, and I hope everyone enjoys uh, the talk. So I want to start with a question for both of you. Um, so what really sparked your interest in the Kingdom of Benin in this area, Richard? So both your works kind of take on different um, parts of the timeline for the history of Benin, but what really sparked your interest? Um, well, for me, it was more trying to interrogate. So obviously, here especially in you know the UK, we know I think um, as a nation quite a bit about um, Benin, or at least we've heard of Benin because of you know the bronzes that are in the British Museum, and they are one of the um, best known artifacts. I think for a lot, you know, most because of the uh, uh, controversy that surrounds them, uh, partly about how they how they came uh, to the British Museum. Um, and I noticed, uh, for me, is when I, you know, the, I, you know, I'm actually a huge fan of, of the British, British Museum generally. But when I went there and I would look at, you know, the artifacts and I'd read some of the the cards and I'd read the cards about uh, the Ben and Bronzes. A lot of the information was um, about the punitive expedition and about the sacking and about they, how they came here, um, which is great. But you know, I think, um, you know, that is the last 100, the last 150 years of a history that is, you know at least 600 years old. Um, so it informs my whole perspective about, you know, Africa, the way in which I think about the African past is that, you know, it is important that we talk about, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, or, you know, colonialism and, and the slave trade, because that, in, you know, that, that's had an impact, or it continues to have an impact and its influences are felt on the world today. But um, putting that in, um, you know, a, a perspective um, and looking actually about, um, you know, other aspects of the past and when it comes to the Ben and Bronzes in particular, you know, how were they made? Who made them? What do they mean? You know, what what purpose do they serve? Um, what do they act as symbols of? All that kind of information was something that I thought was a tiny bit left out of um, of the narrative, and for me should have formed the bulk of the narrative, um, especially when you're presenting, you know, it in a in a in a museum in an educational space. So I wanted to find out a bit more about that, um, and um, hopefully to you know to 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 tell stories about that aspect. Um, of the artifacts. And Paddy, what about you? That's interesting, actually, because my reason was almost the same as yours, in, in a way, in that when I first visited the Benin Bronzes in the British Museum, I was dissatisfied with the, the way they were presented and described. I mean, the, the, the labelling in the British Museum, it's not wrong. I mean, factually, it's accurate. You know, and it even admits to the fact that they were plundered and the, the, there was violence behind uh, their presence in London. But it, it excuses everything somewhat through omission, you know, through brevity, 
Um, so that raised a lot of questions for me, and then I, I went away and tried to find out more about the benim punitive expedition, and it wasn't very easy to do. I mean, in terms of finding a, an authoritative history of the invasion of Benin, um, there really wasn't. This is 15 years ago when I first saw the Benin bronzes. So I thought that, well, I'll write it. I mean, it doesn't exist, so I'll, I'll write it. Brilliant. Uh, and, that, and that's why I wrote this book. So, um, Luke, I want to ask, when we refer to the Kingdom of Benin, what do we really mean by that? And what is the early composition of the kingdom in pre-colonial times? So the, so the Kingdom of Benin itself is probably something that comes about between the 11th to 13th century. So the area in which the Kingdom of Benin is now located was originally a coalition of, 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 of towns. I'd say they were slightly bigger than villages, a coalition of towns. And each town was, um, you know, had its own leader, had its own chief, and the most powerful among them, the one with the access to, you know, the most resources, became their sort of de facto leader. So he was known as as the Ogiso. Now the Ogiso are kind of, they're sometimes described as a as, as a dynasty. They're sometimes heralded as a kind of semi mythical dynasty of kings. You know, there's there's a there's an indication that their their own history and you know the history of this dynasty basically extends so far back into a deep past that it's hard to kind of get out you know what are their what are their true origins but um you know we sort of have a fairly concrete um uh you know we sort of can get a bit of a grasp on them for at least from a thousand uh you know a thousand eighty from 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 the from the tenth century um and um uh, the last uh, of these of these Ogiso um, is an individual called Owodo who's deposed for ruling badly, um, and now this uh, you know this land at the time is basically ruled by 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 two peoples you know uh, largely so they're largely two ethnic groups who who control um, you know this land or this country formed of these formed of these towns so they are the Efa who are the um, those who perhaps have the longest claim. Um, they're known as the original settlers, but that probably means they just came before the Edo. Um, so the Edo people are the ones who, um, are, you know, the Edo people are the ones who now mainly populate Benin and, and, and also, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the dynasty of Oba are also um, Edo peoples. Um, and uh, so the Edo have, uh, oh, they have, uh, you know, their own representatives are the Edio and Edion Embo, Ev Embo who are the Kingmakers Council, and the Effa people, um, you know, have uh, uh, their own representatives. Um, and anyway, after Owodo um, is deposed, then a high-ranking um, Effa nobleman um, called Evian basically tries to, or he institutes a republic, and then afterwards he tries to form, found his own dynasty by naming his son Ogi Amwen, the successor, and the Edionembo, um, uh, you know, don't like that. There, there is jostling of, of power between the Efa um, and the Edo people, the Edo and Embo, um, and they don't like that. So what they do is they um, ask uh, the king, Odudua, of the powerful kingdom of Ife to the northwest um, to send one of his sons, or a minyan, um, to, uh, yeah, you know, to, to, well, to, to send a son, and he decides to send or a minyan. He says, you know, if you, if you protect him on the journey, um, then you know I will send him, and you know he can you know he can be your ruler. But the Edionembo basically are looking for someone neutral, whom they can sort of control. So Odudua sends um, Oraminian, and Oraminian defeats Ogiamwen and his supporters, and um, is well sort of he takes over, I guess, um, you know that that you know that country. But um, he doesn't actually, I wouldn't say, he, he does found Benin, it's mainly his, his son. So he, he marries um, an Edo woman called Enwide, and they have a son, Eweka. And it's actually Eweka who becomes the first Oba. So he founds the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the Oba dynasty, and it's that dynasty which becomes the first of the kingdom of Benin. So that's the real founding of the kingdom. And Oromenian actually returns to Ife, um, to become king thereafter, or Duduwa's death, because that's seen as being the, the the more important the more important kingdom, you know, the homeland, the home of all things. Um, so that's how Benin itself kind of kind of comes about. So, and um, you know, or, or a minion's coming to 
um, you know, to the country of, of the Efra and the Edo is probably, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say, but it's some, I think it's, it's sort of sometime between the 11th and 13th centuries. What well, that's actually sure, depending on um, which, you know, horror story you talk to, it's either slightly earlier or slightly later. Um, but that is generally agreed to be the genesis. And it's, and I think, you know, when you're thinking about the story, it's the most important thing to remember is that, you know, for a lot of the, um, uh, you know, kings of kingdoms which are in contemporary or in modern day Nigeria, Ife is seen as being, um, a, you know, a really important place. Um, um, and, you know, even up until, let's say even, for example, in the 18th century, you had the kings of Oya. And Oya was, in the 18th and 19th century, was the most powerful kingdom probably in West Africa. And even then, you know, they're paying homage to Ife. Um, so it has, so it's traditionally seen as, um, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the progenitor of all these kings and all, the, all these kingdoms. So I guess we could say that the kingdom of Benin kind of formed and evolved through various power struggles. Yes, yeah. And did sure. those continue on into the kind of like 18th, 19th century? Yes, um, yeah, I mean, there are always, um, yeah, there are always power struggles. I mean, sometimes when it comes to, uh, I mean, perhaps not so much for Benin just because uh, you have a primo genitor being introduced. Um, so in the in the sort of mid to late 18th, 15th century with um, Elwari the Great, but you do have actually with um, there's a with a lot of traditional African kingdoms you always have a you almost have a survival of the of the fittest dynamic where because it's it's um, you know the, the choosing of the successor is usually um, elective um, and also you know women queen mothers so the um, the matriarchs play a huge uh, an important role in that but sometimes when a old king dies you would have a succession struggle. And the person who, or not always, but if if there are two candidates who look likely, then that can sometimes turn into um, a struggle. Sometimes quite a quite a brutal struggle, and you know, it's, at the best, that sort of comes out on top. And I suppose you know what that allows for are um, dynasties that continue. So it's that you don't have, you don't necessarily have, um, you know, for lack of a better word, duds inheriting the throne and then ending the dynasty as you saw. I mean, that, that's sort of a example that springs to mind is somewhere like, um, you know, 19th century Russia with like Nicholas II, so he inherits the throne, but because he's not a very good king, it leads to the end of, you know, the Romanov dynasty, um, as opposed to someone who might have been um, better. So maybe not so much in, in, in Benin, but that definitely that founding between the, um, you know, the struggle between the Edio and Ember and, um, you know, the effort representatives is uh, definitely how, the f you know, an important event which leads to the founding of the, of the kingdom. And so what was the kind of pre-colonial relationship between Benin and European countries? I'm thinking particularly in terms of trade relations. The trade relations, um, well, actually really balanced. And this goes for a lot of, um, you, know, uh, you know, before sort of the uh, expansion, the huge expansion um, of, uh, you know, the trade in slave peoples probably from maybe the 16th century onwards. And I think even afterwards, actually, it's hugely balanced. Um, so... Uh, as far as Benin in concer is concerned, it seems to actually be Owari the, Owari the Great who comes to the throne in 1414. He's reckoned to, he's, he's really the, the great reformer of Benin. Um, um, you, know, he, 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 you know, he changes a lot about the kingdom and he makes it a lot more powerful with his conquests, etc. But it's him who has a, um, who really builds up, uh, you know, trade relationships with the, with the Portuguese in particular. Um, and uh, they're trading carry shells, glass beads, and in particular copper, which is important for, for, for the bronzes themselves in exchange for gold, um, ivory, and slaves. But it's him who builds up that, um, builds up that relationships because it's about the late 15th century that the Portuguese are making inroads into the region, you know, into, into modern day um, Nigeria. And Awari the Great capitalizes on that relationships. And you can see it actually in some of the, some of the carvings and some of the artworks. You see representations of um, you know, of Portuguese on things like salt shakers and, you know, um, and bracelets and all that type of stuff. So going on from that, let's get on to the actual formation of the bronzes. Yeah. Um, what was, how was the casting technique for creating bronzes introduced to Benin? Introduced to Benin. So this was, um, I think he's reckoned to be the fifth Uba, or Gwola, who, uh, who again sends to Ife. So Ife is, um, has a very, very, um, yeah, you know, a very, very impressive artistic uh, tradition, like a collection of, of, of artists. I mean, 
you're probably going all the way back to a thousand, uh, you know, a thousand BC with you know the Nok culture, the Nok civilization around that, you know, around that sort of area. Um, and um, so Ogwala is inspired by the artworks there, um, and Ife is most famous for these incredibly realistic, naturalistic uh, heads. Um, and um, but he he asks for artists to be sent from Ife, and they introduce a lot of the. Uh, a lot of sort of the, the, the you know the original brass casting techniques which soon develop into those in which the bronzes or you know which are used for the foundation um, the artistic foundation which leads to uh, the creation of the bed and bronzes such as those in the um, in the uh, in the British Museum but those and that's sort of in the pre 16th century and sort of post 16th century um, and the, the bronzes, the way in which the bronzes in the British Museum are made are, are made using the, the lost wax casting technique, which again is how some of the artworks in Ife are made. And this is a really, yeah, really, really technologically sophisticated technique. So all you do is you, you carve it or what they, they and I, in fact, actually, I think they still, they still do because the, you know, the, the method still exists and it's something that, you know, artists in Nigeria still use, is that you carve a, you carve out of wax like a model you know, realistic model, and then you put um, a thin layer of clay, of clay on it, of soft clay, and then you put um, a layer of hard clay to protect it, and then you heat, you, and then you heat that up. So you know, the the wax melts, and all you're left with is the imprint of what you carved on the inside. And then you pour the you know the boiling copper alloy into it, and wait for it to cool, and then they knock off the clay, and that leaves the um, you know the bronze sculpture but that means every like each sculpture is unique it, it can't be replicated because you've destroyed the mold as, as part of the process um, um, and um, you know the fact that they're able to do this you know to go through those process and you know some of the the works that come out um, are you know uh, like are, are pristine like they're you know they're absolutely beautiful but then if you think about how you have to how to conceptualize how it's going to turn out in the, in the, you know, the final product when you're making the wax model and also when you're impressing the clay because there's some parts which you have to do harder and softer than others um so it's uh it's 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 you know something that's um uh yeah i mean that's why i think that's you know even you know the the, the bronze workers in benin in medieval benin and i think even today, today were a guild you know they were it, that was you know pretty much all they did they were patronized to make bronze artworks in honor of, you know, the royal family and for the royal family. So they made, you know, the plaques. I'm wondering if I can get, see if this works. Yeah, so they make things like these, the, the plaques, which, um, uh, but they also make um, things like big heads, um, you know, to commemorate um, dead obas and, you know, um, some which have scarification marks to represent people from different tribes. And, you know, there's a huge amount of sort of um, uh, virtuosity and, you know, um, you know, technical application, which goes into into making these. I'm glad you've um, spoken about the workers as well and the kind of yes. guild which were, you know, creating the bronzes. Um, I also wondered, you know, how was the kind of like material for the bronzes sourced and what kind of labour effort did that require as well? Sourced, yeah, I think, um, I mean, a lot of it actually seems to come about through trade with the with the Portuguese. That's at least when it seems to boom. So under Awari the Great in the late 15th century and, you know, he's trading his own commodities for copper and it's actually that influx of copper which leads to i think there was some local deposit but it's really with that trade that um that uh yeah it leads to a huge um, um expansion in the amount of works being produced and the amount of different types of works being produced sure. yeah. and when we think about you know the kind of people who are kind of buying the workforce for the Benin Bronzes compared to where the Benin Bronzes were, you know, in palaces, um, yeah, part yeah, of the royal yeah. family. What was the relationship that kind of everyday citizens of the Benin Kingdom had with the Benin Bronzes? What was the purpose of them? What was the kind of like symbolic meaning of them to everyday citizens and not just royalty? So that's a, that's a very good question because um, it's, it's hard to know actually how many, you know, ordinary people would have had the opportunity to see things like the Bronzes. I mean, it's almost a bit like when we're thinking about, you know, artworks in ancient Egypt. I remember, um, uh, learning about um, you know this the, the palette the, the Nama palette which was made in 3000 BC which was something the first Pharaoh of unified Egypt made to commemorate his unification of Egypt but it was you know very small but it was literally only meant to be shown in a like, very specific like spiritual context um, I don't actually think that you know ordinary Beninese would have had or ordinary other people would have had um, access to viewing these I think it was actually more for the king 
and the princes. In fact, you can see, I think, even the two heirs there on the other side and his attendants and his warriors. So it was basically for the elite to be reminded of their role and their responsibility um, in ruling the kingdom and then to remind them of, you know, the relationship that they have with their people and how a king, and, you know, in their own history. Because these are almost like, I mean, it sounds a bit, you know, flippant, but these are almost like... Um, you know, almost for the for the king himself, they're almost like you know family albums. Like they're going, you know, these are if they're made by his ancestors, you know, they're representing, you know, uh, their families um, um, and their you know attendants, people who are important to them. So you know, a king is is when he's looking at bronzes that were made by his own ancestors, he's basically looking at you know the representations of his own ancestors, and he's reminded of um, you know how they behaved and how they acted. Because I think also, I mean, we look at the, the artifacts, you know, by themselves, but don't forget that these were basically just a complement to a corpus, like a, you know, a huge amount of oral history as well. So these are, you know, they're almost like, they're almost like primers. So when you see the artifact, then the king would be remembered of, you know, a story or a history um, or of, you know, um, you know or, or of a particular event um, so they acted, yeah, as almost like prompts, um, reminding him and, you know, and his children um, and his wives and, you know, and his attendants and, you know, uh, the politicians, etc., about how a king is supposed to behave and how they are supposed to behave and the responsibilities of the king and the lives of the king and, you know, all that kind of thing. And of course, I mean, here we kind of have depictions of, like, um, royalty and warriors and family, exactly. and heritage. Exactly. But also, so when I was an undergraduate student, there was a big um, kind of controversy over Jesus College's um, possession of a Benin bronze, which was in mm. the shape of a cockerel. Um, it's been cockerel, returned yeah, now, yeah. thankfully. Yeah. Um, but I wonder about those kind of more, like, miscellaneous items that didn't oh, yeah. necessarily point to, like, a kind of ancestry. What was the purpose of them? Were they purely decorative? No, I mean, some of them are actually um, symbols of things like magic and kingship so for example actually um the cockerel like the uh the spur of a cockerel is reckoned actually in a lot of west african contexts to be like a magical object um so um you know some people would tip like uh you know the ends of, of or you know you have some stories where basically you know one king would if like the cockerel was like the totem of one king and the way to defeat him would to get like would be to get the spur of a cockerel and put it on the end of an arrow and shoot them with it and that would be you know disabling his magic basically so and then so I think you even have in so it's the same thing with like leopards so the leopard for example was a symbol of kingship so if there was um, uh, you know if you saw an artwork where um, a leopard would be represented sometimes would be you know the king himself transformed into a leopard so they they're usually they usually act as, um, as totems or symbols um, of something, uh, for sure, um, whether that's royalty or kingship or, you know, or femin femininity or uh, whatever it is. Brilliant. Um, Paddy, I want to get on to your research. So the kind of famous aggression um, against the Benin Kingdom was the 1897 um, Benin Punitive Exhibition. But, of course, that, you know, comes off the back of, you know, a wealth of imperial and colonial activity in the region of West Africa before then. So could you talk, kind of talk about the backdrop to the Benin exhibition itself and also the kind of um, killing of James Phillip as well? Sure. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Uh, the crucial thing to remember about uh, the British presence in West Africa, of course, is that the, the original sin of the British Empire in, in West Africa, of course, was slavery, the slave trade the transatlantic slave trade. And the, the entity of the British Empire that invaded Benin City, or, or Benin, the Kingdom of Benin, in 1897, was the, the Niger Coast Protectorate, which was gradually built uh, from what were originally uh, slave trading uh, cities and, and so on uh, along the coast. And, and uh, Britain gradually incorporated those um, what had been slave trading uh, city-states into what eventually became the, the Niger Coast Protectorate. And it was the Niger Coast Protectorate that, um, that, that, that attacked Benin City in 1897. And quite frankly, you, it, it was simply because the, the Kingdom of Benin was one of the last remaining rival powers in, in the region. 
and, and as Britain was gradually penetrating the interior of the, the Knight of Delta, you, know, you can see that if you're a, an imperially minded British official uh, in the, the mid 1890s, the Kingdom of Benin would be you know, a, a natural next target for you if your goal is to uh, dominate the, uh, the, the interior markets uh, of, of the region where the, the, the majority of the palm oil um, was, um, was produced. So Benin in this kind of period had retained its independence and we have the um, Oba Ovan Ramwen, um, who has a kind of monopoly on trade, so things like rubber, uh, palm oil, ivory, um, which the British don't like, of course. And what was the British response to this kind of like last vestige of power in West Africa? What did they first attempt against the Benin Kingdom? Sure. It, it's a very gradual process. Um, so over the course of several decades from actually from the sort of 1820s, 1830s, uh, when Britain decided that it would abolish the, the, the trade in slaves, the, uh, all of the, the Liverpool traders and, and, and other European traders essentially switched over to palm oil. Um, and palm oil would be brought down from the interior uh, to the coast uh, by middlemen traders, by, by local people, and bought by British traders on the coast uh, and then taken off um, to Europe. Changes in the, the palm oil trade, you know, structural changes in the palm oil trade, and, and pressures on, on the price of palm oil gradually pushed British traders inland. Uh, they needed to make more money. They wanted to make more money, so they were trying to cut out the middlemen traders. And that was part of the big impetus for, for pushing uh, into the interior, uh, which, of course, brought them up against um, uh, the Kingdom of Benin. And, and in fact, if I may show you, uh, I want to show you, uh, first of all, the chap on the left. This is Major Sir Claude MacDonald, who was the, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure we can say safely that he was the, the most important figure in the creation of the Niger Coast Protectorate in the early 1890s. And that makes him easily one of the most important figures in the creation of what is now Nigeria. I mean, this is, of course, was entirely a British invention um, in the, the late 19th century. You know, there, there hadn't been conceived a Nigeria before uh, the British came along. Um, so he, he's an extremely important figure, uh, and he left uh, he, his post as Consul General of the Niger Coast Protectorate ended just in January 1896. So he was there until, you know, until the eve of the invasion. So I wanted to show you this guy because, I mean, he's super important for Nigeria. But I admit that I also wanted to show you because of his frankly insane moustache. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I don't know how he manages to keep it like that. You know. <laughs> And what was your view of Major Claude MacDonald compared to other colonial officials of this era? Yeah, that's a very important question because, I mean, one has to try hard to be nuanced, <laughs> you know, when looking at colonial officials. I mean, especially a, co a committed anti-colonial like myself, you know, I'm, I mustn't be guilty of assuming all imperial officials to be uh, awful people. Um, so I, I do see MacDonald as a cut above the average imperial official, for sure. I mean, he's uh, d demonstrably intelligent. I mean, he writes very well, um, he and he writes amusingly, in fact. And I've, I've been through thousands, I mean, literally thousands of pages of his dispatches. Um, and he also was, he, he was very clearly attempting to administer justice uh, fairly. I mean, I've, I've seen cases where rather than simply siding with the British trader, you know, he's actually delivered judgments in favor of you know, a local African middleman, for example. Um, so he certainly wasn't, um, uh, you know, like many British officials uh, in the British Empire, simply on the side of, you know, always on the side of the white man. I mean, he seemed to have some... Um, it seemed to be making some effort to administer justice fairly. However, that doesn't, I'm not suggesting that makes him a good guy. I mean, he's guilty of some horrible things. Um, and, and in my book, I, I chanced upon 
a truly horrendous episode that McDonald was directly responsible for, which was the blockade of Opobo. Opobo, um, you can see, Opobo is here. This is a, uh, one of the trading cities of the Delta. And um, the Brits had deposed their king, King Jaja, uh, in 1887. But they were still having trouble fully absorbing um, Opobo into the, the, the British system uh, in 1889. So when MacDonald arrived in, in 1889, he arrived in the Delta region to basically take charge of the future shape of the protectorate that they had just declared. MacDonald decided to blockade Opobo. And o Opobo is on a riverine island. So it's easy enough to blockade the, the city if you have you know, the, the naval force, which of course the, the Brits had. So they blockaded the city, um, forced it to give up uh, its firearms and, and essentially incorporated it more fully into the British structure. And in the British documents from 1889, that's presented as a bloodless, clean, very neat, operation to disarm a rival power. However, MacDonald then accidentally gave the game away in a, a memorandum that he wrote in 1895, if I remember correctly, where he, in a totally separate discussion about the practicalities of disarming local people, referring to a blockade, he said, oh yeah, blockades are really difficult. I mean, we tried it in Opobo back in 1889, and it just meant dozens of women and children being starved to death. <laughs> you know? I mean, he didn't mention that at all in the 1889 documents. But because he happened to mention that quite by accident, uh, in, a, in a totally different memo uh, years later, we, we now know that we I mean, an unknown number but certainly a, you know, a significant number of women and children were starved to death. And obviously, we can assume a number of men as well. Um, so yes, even, even a relatively decent colonial official like McDonald can be guilty of some horrible things. Yeah. Um, just a reminder to those watching online that if you want to um, ask any questions, then um, please do send those through. So I want to get onto this figure. So Acting Council um, General James Phillips. Now, he's a particular figure of interest and controversy um, in your book because of the conspiracy to depose the Oba of Benin. So do you want to um, speak through that? Sure. Thank you. And yes, you're absolutely right. Um, so this, this idiot here on the right is, <laughs> is uh, James Phillips. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, he was responsible for the, the, the whole fiasco that led directly to the, uh, the Benin punitive expedition. I mean, the, 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 the very basic sequence of events is that uh, so MacDonald was actually promoted to become minister for China at the beginning of 1896. So he, he went off to a, you know, a much more glamorous career in, uh, in East Asia. Uh, a chap called Ralph Moore took over for, as Consul General from MacDonald, and then Ralph went on leave uh, at, back to the UK in the summer of 1896, and this guy, James Phillips, arrived uh, to, to fill in for, um, for Moore uh, while he was on leave. So James Phillips arrives in the, the uh, Niger Coast Protectorate on October the 21st, 1896, and I mentioned the date because the, the date is important. And then he decides that he uh, wants to take a mission to Benin City. So Phillips takes a, a mission. It's not altogether nine British uh, members. There were, you know, a couple of consuls. There were a couple of traders and you know, a couple of officers. You know, the, the normal kind of a little mission that you would take, and about 240 or so carriers, men, you know, manservants, um, and so on. He sets off to go to, to visit Benin City. He set off in December of 1896, and all along the way, the, the, the journey to Benin, uh, everybody is telling him not to go. Uh, 
uh, his own officials are advising him not to go. The local chiefs and you know friendly local advisors are telling him, you know, you mustn't visit the, the king. Uh, the Oba hasn't given permission, and in fact, the Oba said specifically not to visit. Um, and Phillips ignores all of that, uh, continues on, and in the march from Guato, so they go, so he, he, of course, went from Old Calabar, came round by boat, and up the Benin River, and then up the Guato Creek, and then from Guato, you march overland to Benin City. That's about two days from Guato to Benin City. Uh, on the, the 4th of January, 1897, Phillips and party set out from Guato uh, against all advice and were ambushed by Benin soldiers uh, and the entire party, essentially, the entire party was killed. Um, the two Brits escaped, uh, Locke and... Um, uh, his name has escaped me. Um, an unknown number of um, carriers and so on escaped. Um, but because of the death of Phillips and party, you know, the, the, the natural thing for the British Empire in those days was obviously to mount a, a punitive expedition. So then that was swiftly followed by a punitive expedition, um, which marched, again, you go up the Benin River, they... Um, established a base camp here, Alobo, marched north, uh, captured Benin City, um, where, of course, as everybody knows, the, the, literally every single uh, item that they could find was packed up and taken to London, and then the city was burned out. And that all happened uh, within a few weeks, within five weeks of Phillips being killed, the, uh, the, the city was in ruins. So before we go specifically into some of the atrocities of that, I just want to ask quickly, um, so some of the new evidence that you introduced in the book is from Phillips's school days, um, obtained from the archive at Uppercombe School. Um, so you call him an idiot. Is it based on the material there? What do you learn from Yes, uh, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because, I mean, I, I use the word idiot advisedly. I mean, it wouldn't, and, and it's not just on the way he looks. I mean, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be, you know, that wouldn't be historical. I mean, I, I call him an idiot because I have documentary proof that, that, he, you know, that he, is, he, is, he was a duffer. And, and that's it. Don't, don't worry about reading this, because I'll read out a key bit. But I just wanted you to see this, because, as Jason says, I, I found in the Uppingham School archive um, some absolutely hilarious material about Phillips uh, when, of course, when, when, after he died. Now, obviously, this is his, his own school magazine, they're writing an obituary of an old boy of the school who has, in their view, died gloriously on the, you know, the, the frontiers of the empire. So, of course, they're trying to say something as nice as they can about him. Obviously, you know, they want to present him in a positive light. But I found it quite striking um, how faint the praise that they could find about him was. Um, this is a key bit. This is a verbatim quotation from this article. Talking about Phillips, this article says, quote, He was not head and shoulders above the rest of us in anything, except perhaps that priceless thing which we call keenness. He was not a first-rank scholar. He was not a first-rank athlete. He never wrote anything brilliant for this magazine. <laughs> uh, and apparently he read his Bible regularly and hunted out evil with genial indignation whatever that means. <laughs> um, and the highest praise that they could find to say about him was that he was a sportsman, e even despite being bad at athletics. Uh, and then in a, another article in the same magazine, in the, the Uppingham School magazine in November, so this, of course, is long after the, um, you know, the, 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 expedi the punitive expeditions has happened, the bronzes are in London, and there, there have been all kinds of celebrations around the country. Uh, they say... Quote, there was nothing so remarkable about him as a young man at school or college to make him eminently noticeable, except that he was a high-spirited young man, full of life and energy. He probably did not impress his contemporaries. <laughs> <laughs> and this is them trying to be nice. Yeah. <laughs> now, th this is, I mean, it's, it, I find it very funny, but it is also important because the fact is that Phillips completely messed up. You know, he arrived, I mentioned the date because 
He arrived in October, he arrived on October 21st, 1896, in the Protectorate. He knew nothing whatsoever about the Protectorate before. He'd never even been there. He was, in fact, he was actually um, posted in Ghana, in the Gold Coast, um, for a, a couple of years before that. So he knew nothing about the area. But having arrived on the 21st of October, on the 16th of November, he wrote a despatch to... Uh, again, don't worry about reading it. I'll read out a key bit. Uh, but I just wanted you to see that. That's a copy of the actual despatch, um, dated November the 16th, 1896, where Phillips, having been in the protectorate for only three weeks and two days, has already decided that, that he has to depose the king of Benin. Three weeks and two days. Um, and in fact, this is the key... You might be able to read that, but I'll read it out. He's, so he's writing to the Foreign Office in London in his capacity as Consul General of the Niger Coast Protectorate. I am certain that there is only one remedy, that is to depose the King of Benin from his school, from his stool. Uh, I therefore ask his Lordship's permission to visit Benin City in February next to depose and remove the King of Benin. Now, this is crucial evidence that the Phillips mission was emphatically not peaceful. Because the way it's presented in a lot of museum signage, even, you know, is um, that the Edo soldiery destroyed a peaceful British mission or a, you know, a trade mission or something like that. You know. and, he, and this is universal. Even in The Guardian, the, I, not, I'm not saying The Guardian is a moral arbiter. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying that yeah. you would expect The Guardian to to at least make the effort, you know, to, to verify the facts. You know, yeah. they would have at least that kind of progressive sensibility to, you know, get the facts right. I remember an article about the Benin Bronzes in The Guardian a few years ago called the Phillips Mission Peaceful. Wow. And it's like, well, it was unarmed. That's true. It wasn't a military expedition. And the, the sidearms of the officers being of no importance. So it, it was certainly not a military expedition, but it was emphatically not peaceful because his entire aim was ultimately to, to depose and remove the King of Benin. So this, for me, this is a smoking gun document that, that proves beyond all doubt that um, Philip's intention was not peaceful. And of course, with the um, 1897 response by the British, um, often there's a lot of focus on the specific looting of the bronzes, um, but your book and your research uncovers new evidence of colonial wrongdoing, including sexual violence, and proof that the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, oversaw the cover-up of crimes of Consul George Annesley. Um, how did you uncover this evidence? And in your words, what do you think is the full story of this exhibition? Sure. So, um, yeah, that's a a really critical area because I think we, we also have to look when considering the Benin punitive expedition or the invasion of Benin we, we have to look at it in the context of um, the, the claims that Britain was making for its presence as a whole in the region because obviously I, I, mean, I think everybody will have some rough idea that you know Empire types at the time liked to promote their, th this notion of them spreading civilization and spreading, you know, rule of law and all this sort of thing. Um, you know, they were making a moral claim for the British presence. And so if there is any truth in that, then we are required, I think, to look at the to, to, to look at those claims, look at the moral basis of the British presence in, in the region, in the Niger Coast Protector that I indicated uh, earlier. And that was why this kind of evidence that I found about this shocking wrongdoing of Consul Ansley um, is important to, to answering that question. So in, in brief, uh, in 18, uh, the late 1889, when MacDonald was in the region visiting the entire region to decide what kind of British official structures needed to be built. While, whilst MacDonald was carrying out that process, 
a, a chap called George Ainsley was appointed as consul in Old Calabar. So he was consul for you know, what became the, the Niger Coast Protectorate. And this, I mean, the, the, this year and a half or so that he is in Old Calabar was horrendous. I mean, he ran a rule of, uh, you know, reign of terror. I mean, he, he would, I think, I mean, obviously I'm not a, a psychiatrist, but I, th I would feel reasonably confident of saying that he was actually psychopathic. I mean, he was incredibly violent, um, responsible for uncounted number of deaths of local people. I mean, he had a habit of literally attacking villages. I mean, he would, you know, burn down villages, he'd march his soldiers, his small unit of soldiers into villages and, you know, I mean, it was uh, responsible for the death of many people. But possibly the most unpleasant of Ainsley's crimes that I uncovered was this horrendous sexual crime that you mentioned. Um, I won't go into great detail because it's, it's really appalling. Um, but essentially, he, he seized a local woman in Old Calabar. And in fact, this is important for me. Uh, I, I, in fact, decided to dedicate my book to this woman because we know her name and we have her testimony of, of what happened. But of course, apart from that, she is, you know, a, a essentially uncounted victim of the British Empire about whom we know very little. Um, but uh, so Annesley had this woman seized and brought to his quarters in the British consul in Old Calabar. Then he ordered his soldiers uh, to come upstairs to his quarters where he held her down and ordered them to rape her. And this is just so shocking, it was horrendous. But we know about this because it ha just so happened that a, a, a chap called um, Alfred Turner was chained up, literally chained up by An Annesley, chained to a post outside Annesley's quarters. So he, he could hear and see, well, he, he could see the comings and goings, and he could hear everything. Uh, and then Turner took it upon himself to write a letter, literally, to the Prime Minister making this allegation against uh, Ainsley. And because that letter arrived at the Foreign Office, at the time Lord Salisbury was both Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary, um, because of that letter, uh, the Foreign Office thought, oh, OK, I guess we better look into this. So they, they instituted a, in fact, MacDonald ordered an investigation. And for that reason, uh, a, a consul interviewed everybody, took sworn statements. So I found the documents you know, hidden away in the Foreign Office archives of these sworn statements of Ekang herself, of the soldiers involved, of Turner, the witness, and, and, and others. You know, sworn statements, very carefully compiled by a diligent vice consul. So this document, this um, dossier was compiled and sent to the Foreign Office. So the Foreign Office knew all the details about Ainsley's wrongdoing, horrendous wrongdoing, um, and decided to quietly pension him off. That's the most appalling thing, is that you know, everybody knew about all, all his crimes in some detail, but there was no question of holding a, you know, a, a court case or punishing him in any way. They, they retired him off with a pension, by the way. And so the evidence that, that you asked about is um, this. So this, this is the Marquis of Salisbury, who, as I say, was both Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary at the time. Uh, this is 1891 this is happening, by the way. Um, now, the evidence that the Prime Minister himself knew of the appalling crimes of George Annesley is this document on the right here. So uh, don't, uh, don't worry about reading it. I'll, I'll read it out. But I just wanted you to see it again because this is the smoking gun document that proves beyond all doubt that the Prime Minister knew of this wrongdoing. So this is from his private foreign office private secretary, a chap called Sir Eric Barrington. Lord Salisbury, 
it will be a good thing if Annesley retires. There are some very nasty stories about his proceedings in the oil rivers. That's the United Delta. Uh, proceedings in the oil rivers which are getting about outside. E.B., that's Eric Barrington, November the 25th, and this, this is 1891. The smoking gun is the S for Salisbury, which, of course, tells us that um, Salisbury had read the <coughs> documents on, of which this is the file note, and he's written very bad indeed. <laughs> You know, so we know, we know beyond all doubt that the Prime Minister knew of these appalling crimes of uh, Consul Annesley and yet uh, conspired in, in um, pensioning him off uh, with no question of punishment. And so with this evidence that you've uncovered, how do you think this factors into contemporary debates around reparations and about repatriation of um, Ben and Bronzes? Sure. To me, it's extremely obvious. Everything has to go back. I mean, it's, it's very, very simple. Um, and all arguments against repatriation, <coughs> I think, are various degrees of insulting nonsense about, oh, well, you know, they won't be able to look after them properly. I mean, that's just deeply racist, deeply insulting. Um, and, I, I mean, Nigeria for sure has, you know, problems with corruption and so on, as we do here, by the way. Um, but it seems a very bizarre argument to attempt to say that, well, yeah, we stole these, but we're not going to give them back in case somebody steals them. <laughs> you know, that's, just, it, it, that's it, utterly illogical. So they have to give back. And I have a question which kind of brings in um, Luke's research. Sorry, yeah, Luke's research as well. Um, when we think about the bronzes going back, so I'm actually from this region of Nigeria where my father's family was. Um, and who should these bronzes go back to? If we consider the relationship between the monarchy and the people and the relationship as it stands today and the kind of strength of feeling that, you know, Nigerians and um, the people, Edo people of Benin have, where should these bronzes be going? Should they be going directly to the monarchy because these were the possessions or should they be, you know, publicly accessible for Nigerians? What do you guys sure. think? Yeah, see, I think that's, yeah, no, that's a very, really interesting question. I think partly because of the way in which, you know, uh, sort of, you know, artefacts and material culture, the way in which, you know, Traditionally, especially, um, you know, many African societies have kind of, you know, uh, behaved with regards to their material culture is that it's still, a, you know, it's still something that, you know, they engage with as though it was made yesterday. I think, uh, you know, the idea, you know, my background sort of in archaeology, anthropology, and, you know, when we're looking at, I remember, you know, even doing, you know, I've done a bit of research as well on museums themselves and, you know, the museum as an institution and as a space and, you know, you realise this actually grows out of a fairly distinctly European practice, at least contemporary museums, beginning with the Cabinet of Curiosities and, you know, the sort of the, uh, you know, the 15th, 16th century. But, you know, the idea of having um, artefacts, even, you know, precious artefacts like the Ife heads or the Benin bronzes behind glass cases for, you know, ordinary people to, you know, to look at and appreciate as part of their heritage is, is, is at least, I mean, I, it's not, I, I don't know, um, it's not something that I've seen grow out of, uh, of, you know, in sort of, um, or, you know, sort of grow organically in, um, in African cultures. I remember it's like in uh, Ghana, we have, you know, the, uh, the Akwasia Day Festival, and you literally have, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the Akan chiefs attendants firing guns that are 200 years old as if they were made yesterday. And like any, museum curator would be like, you know, what are you doing? And, you know, they're wearing, you know, they're wearing regalia and they're wearing, you know, headdresses, you know, things that are probably centuries, you know, centuries old um, because, you know, history is, uh, you know, history is alive. You know, it's, it's all, you know, the, the material culture is alive and it's something that, you know, people engage with. So I think it is a good question. You know, I think it would be important actually if, you know, ordinary Nigerians could, you know, would be able to say, and I know there is the, the Benin Museum, sure, the sure. museum being made. I mean, that, that, that's true, but, I mean, the fact is it's not up to us. No. You know, that's, that's I mean, true. it's none of we our could. business. I mean, they, they could melt them all down if they wanted. That's none of our... No, that's it's not true. up to us. Um, that's true. So, you know, none of these factors about the terms of repatriation uh, should be an obstacle. You know, yeah, I mean, that's true. You know, we, we, you know, the state of Nigeria exists, so... You know, we, we, we took, return them to Nigeria and then how they decide to distribute them within Nigeria or, or if, if they decide to sell them or give them back to us. Or, I mean, that's, that's totally up to them, in yeah. my view.
Yeah, yeah. No, I um, so I think now we have time for some audience questions. If anyone has any burning questions at all, um, don't be shy. Yeah. <laughs> Is it all very clear? Or do um, I mean, I've got some questions through online as well. Um, so a question for Luke. Um, can you speak on court life during early modern Benin, uh, particularly the role of matriarchs? Oh, the matriarchs, Ben, OK. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, this is something that, you know, seems to be actually a, a characteristic feature of a lot of, um, well, sort of West West and South African uh, kingdoms in particular, is that, you know, the the mother of the king and the mother figure is, is paramount. And I imagine that would have been, you know, the uh, uh, a similar thing for, uh, uh, you know, was probably a similar thing for Benin, um, is that, uh, you know, when it comes to making important decisions, um, not, not necessarily for you know the descendants of the king, but also to do with politics, society, culture, um, it is the mother of the king who has a say, and then you know that also extends to um, uh, as well to the king's uh, you know to the king's wife, the king's wives. Um, so would be a um, you know so the the. You know the organisation would be uh, polygamous, but there would be, um, you know, a hierarchy um, with regards to, uh, you know, with regards to the, the king's wives, and again, those who were, I would say, I mean, the the mother of the heir, because obviously they were all, you know, technically mothers of the heir again, you know, because there was, I mean, at least not until Aware come, you know, before um, Aware comes in was probably elective, but then yeah, I guess you have primogenitor with Aware, so it'll probably be the first child of his first wife. Um, but, you know, yeah, mother figures basically, and well, female figures, and especially elite female figures, royal women, um, would have played uh, a part in most of the Beninese courtly life, um, from politics to, yeah, religion to even, you know, uh, warfare, uh, whether most likely, uh, Put, being put in charge of uh, the political administration of the kingdom, let's say, whilst the king was, um, you know, leading the army, things like that. Great. Do we have any audience questions yet? Oh. Uh, yeah, go on. Oh, wait, um, does anyone else have their hand up? No. Okay. Yeah. No, I think. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm really taking advantage of the fact that I'm sat in the front row. Um, <laughs> Paddy, I didn't expect to have tears in my eyes listening to a talk at his fest, but that account of the woman that was attacked is just horrific. Um, shocking, yeah. I, I guess my question to you, without going into too many details about the specifics, because it is, you know, trigger warning and all the rest of it, um, what's it like going through these documents? Do you, like, as a historian, the process of reading these terrible accounts, how do you do that? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean... Working in the field that I'm working in, and I'm still working in the area of colonial violence in southern Nigeria at the moment, it's it, it's depressing. I mean, it's it's one horrendous wrongdoing after another. Um, yeah, it's it, that's pretty awful. But I suppose one thing that makes it feel worthwhile is that. Well, I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to do my bit by publicizing this kind of thing, because you know, I'm, I'm not well qualified to talk about certain things to do with um, you know, Nigeria and, and, and so on. Um, but I am well qualified to expose British wrongdoing. <laughs> you know? um, I mean, that's what I'm trained in, essentially. Um, so knowing that, yeah, Knowing that I, I can try and make um, you know some tiny kind of amends by at least airing these appalling episodes of wrongdoing is um, something that yeah keeps one going through the, the, the grim process of reading this stuff. Yeah. But yes, it was a shock, and and it, and it was a it was a real shock to discover that Toronto documents in the archives because. Ainsley ought to be famous, you know, for being a bad guy. You know, he ought to be well known. Oh my God, this horrendous um, official who abused his powers and everything. But you know, because of the power of the British government at the time, it was easy 
you know, easy task for them to hide him in the archives. I think we have time for one more question, I think. Um, anyone in the audience has one? Um, is there, there. I think we're going until, six, until quarter past, though. Oh, quarter past, okay, we've got time. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> I, for some reason, thought we were going until four. Hi, Paddy. So uh, good to see you again. Um, uh, we've, we've spoken before, um, and I, I'm just curious as to how do you see modern British politics uh, playing out in light of your discoveries, and do you see any type of? I mean, I, I hear this all the time from British politicians, but I'd like to get your your take. Do you think that there's any appetite to, in some way? offering some sort of apology to the people of the region uh, and, and and you talk about reparations and that's a small step to even just to say sorry uh, do, you, do you think there's any appetite in this country because you know until today people still think that you know slavery was a long time ago it, it, it yeah. didn't have any bearing um, sure do you, do you think there's any appetite sure uh, ba basically no I mean in the in the in the case of you know, in, individuals, well-meaning individuals, for sure. But in terms of the establishment, the existing power structures and so on, emphatically not, because if we were to begin to have the, the right kind of conversations about the impact of colonialism, the implications of that conversation are so terrifying for capital interests or people in a position of power now that it would, it would be the end of everything for them. I, what I mean is that if you're thinking about reparations for colonialism, it is possible to put figures on that. Um, for example, the Indian economist Utsa Patnaik has calculated a rough figure for the amount of wealth extracted from the subcontinent of India uh, through the entire, by, by Britain, through the entire uh, period of um, colonialism, she puts that figure at $45 trillion. Now, I mean, obviously, there's a big conversation to be had about her methodology, and I'm sure, you know, lots of problems to identify and so on, but that, whatever. It, you know, even if she's out by, you know, $20 trillion, it's still a staggeringly large sum of money. Now, obviously, if we were to begin to think about practical ways of repaying that money, and I'm not saying this is ever likely in any way, but you know, if, if we were to begin to start thinking about repaying that, to do so would require the upending of our entire socioeconomic system. And that's just, that's just India, um, you know, India and Pakistan. Um, and we can put similar figures on you know, the transatlantic slave trade and, and so on and so forth. And if, if one was to do that, um, you know, the, so uh, uh, it, the, end, the implications for the existing power structures and, and capital interests would be catastrophic. And um, I think that's why they, you know, the, the, the establishment generally does not want to begin to have a proper conversation about even something like, which might appear to be fairly harmless, like the repatriation of the Benin bronzes, because once you start that process, you know, it, it, the, the, it leads to, you know, the implication is that it would then lead to, well, how do we deal with the other impacts of colonialism? And then, and then the, the ultimate end would be, you know, revolution. So it's too dangerous for them. And, that, and that's why the Telegraph didn't review my book, I'm sure. <laughs> um, do we have any more audience questions? Um, I've actually got a question myself um, for Luke. Um, so your um, upcoming book, Mother Country? That's Motherland. It. Motherland, Motherland yeah. that's it, sorry. Um, no, no, sorry. So that doesn't deal as much with the kind of kingdom of Benin, but I just kind of wonder, so you are looking at 500,000 years of history. Um, I wonder what your kind of like research process, you know, for this book is and how your kind of like research into Benin has kind of like perhaps aided um, your research here. Yep. Um, so... Um, because of the way in which I've decided, I've decided to tackle the um, the book uh, uh, thematically. So it's basically, um, you know, uh, ten, you know, ten, eleven chapters, and each chapter focuses on a different uh, 
theme of or cultural or historical theme that um, I've seen as being um, important or at least has come up in, in my research um, as, uh, as, as you know, applicable to traditional African um, you know, cultures and, and societies and also the deeper African past, i.e., I need to find actually a better word, but for lack of a better term, pre-colonial history. Um, so been looking, because, yeah, you know, it's sort of, I think, you know, I'm just trying to think of it as, um, as, as African history, you know, and so, um, uh, so depending on which theme I'm tackling, so, you know, they range from, um, you know, oral history and, and, and storytelling and the importance of storytelling in the formation of historical narratives um, to matriarchy and queen mothers in ancient and medieval Africa um, to trade, migration and movement um, um, in East Africa. I look at a different time period and I look at, uh, look at a different place. Um, so, for example, um, you know, looking at um, matriarchy and queen mothers, I look at ancient Sudan, so from about 1000 BC to... Uh, maybe 200 AD, 250 AD, um, and I also look at early modern Angola, looking at Queen Nijinga and her um, resistance um, against sort of uh, Portuguese colonialism, um, which was actually, you know, one of the most um, successful resistances when it comes to stopping the, uh, the the Portuguese advance. I try and concentrate on a history from the African perspective. I think there is, um, you know, a lot of you know important work actually is being done, you know, as, you know, Pat is, is, is so artfully demonstrated today. Um, and, you know, and actually, you know, with, with what you're doing with your work, there's a lot of important stuff being done about, um, you know, the relationship, especially when, you know, uh, people are based here, the relationship between Africa and Europe um, and, uh, you know, the, the lives of Europeans in Africa and the lives of Africans in Europe. But we don't really talk a lot about the lives of Africans in Africa before Europe was, you know, on, on the world stage, you know, before. And, you know, that is most of human history is, is, is you know, is, is that, is that. So I, I go back actually to, um, to, you know, the origins of our species. And I talk about, you know, Homo sapiens in, in East Africa and their emergence there. And I sort of try and take people through you know, different regions and different time periods to demonstrate that, you know, in different places at different times, um, you know, this is what African communities uh, were doing, what African peoples were doing, and that, you know, there is, you know, we do, it's a very, 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 very important to remember, um, you know, the aspect of our existence when we were, you know, um, you know, exploited in, you know, as, you know, enslaved peoples and as, um, you know, colonial subjects, but, you know, as we, are and you know continue to be and as we were you're also rulers and traders and travelers and scholars and artisans i mean you know something like the um you know the uh the uh, manuscripts in, in timbuktu i mean there's you know astrological knowledge or an astronomical knowledge there that you know uh, that demonstrates that some of the scholars in medieval mali in the 13th and 14th centuries you know were uh, uh shared, were were you know, uh, originating and sharing, you know, theories um, that were, you know, more advanced than, you know, Galileo's. And so, but it's just stuff that we don't really know about. Um, so trying to tackle that kind of history and to try and bring that a bit more into the fore and, and make it a sort of counterbalance to some of the history which we, we, we focus on um, is, uh, you know, is, 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 is the sort of the point of the book and, and the point of the stories that I try and tell in the different chapters focusing on, on different aspects. Uh, okay. so, sorry, if, if I may jump in. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to, to show you everybody this, uh, um, which sort of follows on yes, yeah, from what uh, Luke is uh, saying, because yeah. th this is a, a sketch map of Benin City yeah. drawn by one of the British officers on the 1897 expedition. So th this is Benin City that they found when they uh, arrived in the city um, on the 21st of February, 1897. And I, I wanted to show everybody this because this is quite at variance from the idea, the popular idea of Africa and you know African history that that was current, you know, at, at the time of the of the expedition and through much of the 20th century. In fact, you know, what this shows quite clearly is what is recognisably a city. You know. It's, a city with streets and avenues and public buildings and, you know, it's unquestionably recognizably a city. Two days after this was drawn, they burnt it down. 
and then and part of it partly was by accident, but uh, you know much of it was deliberate. And then after that, in in terms of the popular media, um, you know surrounding the British uh, invasion of Benin, the idea of Africa or the idea of Benin that was transmitted to the general public was you know the the sort of the the mud hut trope of Africa, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not not the highly developed urban environment, yeah. Africa. Yeah. You know that that we can clearly see they found when they arrived. I mean, it wasn't there when they left because they had burnt it down, but it was there. Uh, you yeah, know, you when, when, see, when they got there, you can see obviously that's just the king's compound there, and then you have the queen's, you know, own, yeah, the, you know, that, when own he, separate he residence. Says, he says queen's compound. That's actually the queen mother. The queen course. mother's, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But that, you know, the you know the fact that this was, uh, you know, in terms of. There's like a, there's a huge amount of planning that's gone, which is not only on an urban level, but also would take into and, account and it's ancient culture. And, well, not, exactly. not not ancient, but you I know mean, it's, it's several hundred years old. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, it would take into account society, culture, etc. It all kind of yeah. connects together. So I mean, that was there. Yeah. And then the British expedition came along and, and destroyed it. So yeah. you know, our, our intervention, our violent intervention in uh, in, in African cultures like Benin. Um, <laughs> You know, had, had a, a ruinous impact. And Benin was especially known for its very high walls as well. Are there any photos really which walls, survive? Yeah. Well, but yeah, although on, 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 on the wall thing, though, the, I mean, in some places it's slightly mis misrepresented as saying that Benin's city walls were longer than the, wall, the Great Wall of Great China. Wall of China yeah, that, that's actually yeah. not true. What, what they mean is um, the, within the kingdom of Benin, if, if you add up all of the separate earthworks and, and so on, you know, in separate, yeah, in, in separate villages yeah, yeah, and so yeah, yeah, on. So it, it's not one big wall. Yeah, 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 of course, yeah. Yeah, but, um, but, but the, yes, you're right, the Benin walls and, and the palace were very highly developed, even as far back as the 17th century. You see, you've seen Dapert's, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. sorry, the Dapper, um, the, the etching. Yes, yeah, yeah. With, you know, the, the Dutch um, illustrations from the 17th century showing a, very highly developed, beautiful palace, you know, with tall conical roofs, and and very evidently the um, bronze castings, you know, uh, eagle castings on on the top of the the, the towers. Um, yeah, so very, some very highly developed. Um, and it's because you see these, you know, and you can see sort of similar, you know, similar you know, st structures and, and artworks and and you know examples of architecture all around, you know, with. Great Zimbabwe, or mm. you know the the Sankore Mosque in, in Mali, or even the um, the smaller uh, 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 sort of the tombs and the pyramids in in Sudan, uh, which were you know built by the ancient Kushites, and so you know it, it all kind of uh, speaks as well, perhaps to um, almost like also on a on a deep cultural level, this you know uh, uh, you know this. This, there's a strong urban element which is part of you know cultures for millennia, um, but you know doesn't really shine through with some of the uh, or you know something that perhaps could be brought a bit more into the fore. We have time for one last quick question. You've got a question. Thank you. Uh, so, connects to what you were just saying about um, you know the sophistication of the city. Uh, so, obviously, there's a real paradox in finding these beautiful objects of the bronzes, which are evidence of, you know, super sophisticated society, which has an interest in art and culture. Uh, and then the idea that um, they're actually sort of, you know, native savages that we have to destroy. Um, when the um, bronzes were taken back to Britain, was there any awareness of like um, that sort of, I guess, disjunct or disconnect that um, uh, we'll kind of destroy the culture or like kind of the people who created the culture, but then we kind of gratify ourselves by looking at it. It reminded me a bit of, you know, how the London Illustrated News has this very racialized depiction of the Assyrian wonders that kind of come out um, in the British Museum. Like, is anybody kind of saying that at the time in contemporary sources? Sure, sure. No, that, that's a, a, a crucial issue because it, um, it that, that, dis, uh, that apparent disconnect between, you know, what they were insistent on thinking of as savages and this extraordinarily skilled artwork, that, that produced this bizarre um, misunderstanding when, they, when the bronzes arrived back in London, which was even the staff at the British Museum, Ormond, Reed, and, and uh, Dalton, 
uh, who are the curators of um, uh, of the I, I can't remember what the which department the British Museum was, but um, they, when faced with this corpus of Benin work, were so staggered by its high quality that their bizarre conclusion was that it could not have been made in Benin. Yeah. You know, it's so advanced. Well, I mean, this obviously can't have been made by them. It must be Egyptian, you know, or yeah. Portuguese, yeah. or, yeah. you know. So they, they were casting around for wild solutions of, of precisely that conundrum. Um, and then eventually, that was in the article, and eventually they accepted that, in fact, it was of uh, local manufacture. But, but yes, it was, it was impossible. Immediate, initially, it was impossible for them to deal with that contradiction. Yeah, it happens. Sorry to jump in. It just happens a bit later on as well with the, um, you know, with the heads of Vifa. I remember because again, it's sort of bound up with, uh, you know, the 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 beginnings of, in fact, uh, you know, anthropology and archaeology as, as as a discipline. So I think you have with the heads of Vifa. I mean, um, actually, one 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 person puts forward um, the idea they were made by. Um, Atlanteans before he said that they were made by <laughs> Africans. So he, they were really, but you get Greeks, Arabs, Phoenicians, and the ancient inhabitants of Atlantis, I think, for the heads of Ife. Uh, um, this is Leo Frobenius. He's a German philologist and an anthropologist. Uh, um, and you know, he is good, but uh, yeah, there was, yeah, and yeah. Great Zimbabwe as well. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's interesting you mentioned the ILN, the Illustrated London News, because would you believe the, the Illustrated London News had a correspondent in Benin City in the wake of the expedition. I mean, quite remarkable. I don't know if everybody knows, but the, the Illustrated London News was a, you know, a high circulation Illustrated Daily of the you know, late Victorian, <laughs> early, um, early 20th century period. And as such, was a, an important publication. I mean, it was you know, like the, the, the Times, but for you know, perhaps slightly less literate people. <laughs> and it was so important, as I say, it, it had a, um, a correspondent in Benin. And what's really interesting is to tr track the way that the illustrations done by the Illustrated London News uh, correspondent are changed as they are copied and replicated in other, um, other publications. And if anyone wants to follow this up, it, it's in the work of Annie Coombs, who's a uh, specialist in representations of uh, the Benin bronzes. And you can see from the original Illustrated London News original sketches, <coughs> as they are replicated or copied in other publications, the depiction of local people declines from the original one where a couple of African guys are talking to a British guy looking over a map and stuff, and the African guys are in suits. In the next version, you know, they're shirtless, <laughs> you know. Then in the third version, they're, they're without shoes. And then in the fourth version, they're outside a mud hut. I mean, it's as, as obvious as that. You know, there, there seems to be a deliberate, um, you know, a determination to misrepresent African cultures um, and thereby reflect better on oh, no. our violence towards them or, or justify our violence towards them. Great. Um, I believe that's all we have time for, isn't that? Yeah. yeah.